how do you improve on classical guitar? That's what we're gonna talk about today and we're gonna get started right now. Uh, one of the questions I got was the uh, somewhat provocative question, can someone be stupid in guitar? And then I also had another question about how do you know when to play a stacked chord simultaneously versus roll it? Uh, also a question of how do you know when to play uh, notes at a certain area of the neck? Uh, so great questions and I've received others in advance. I'd love to also hear your questions in the chat. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. So, can someone be stupid in guitar? Uh, this question was from FD, and uh, he said, if so, should I just give up trying to understand? Um, I get it, I've certainly felt stupid in guitar, so I can sympathize with the question. Uh, sometimes you may just feel like, I'm stupid in music, I'm stupid in guitar, this is never gonna work out, I should give up. Uh, well, let me just encourage you, don't give up. Uh, a lot of times I think we get a misconception about how important talent is in learning music and learning the guitar. In other words, uh, we get the impression that, hey, either you just have this massive talent in playing the guitar or you don't. You have this talent in music or you don't. Now, talent plays a role, I just think it's a lot smaller role than we think. Uh, in other words, if you put in daily time with the guitar, I believe that almost anyone can learn to play this instrument uh, to a decent level of proficiency. Now, yes, somebody may have more proficiency or more natural talent that allows them to be one of the best in the world, uh, but is the question just can you become good at playing the guitar? I think almost anyone can. And I think, again, that role of talent is smaller than we might think. The role of talent is like, let's say if there's a 10 point scale and the best guitar player in the world is a level 10, well, talent is gonna make the difference between being like a level seven and a level 10. But to get to a level seven, an acceptable level of playing the guitar is certainly something that almost anyone can do. So I hope that's encouraging to you uh, if you're wondering, hey, am I just stupid at guitar? Am I just stupid at at music? Um, I don't think so. I think with the right information and with regular practice. Those are really the two ingredients, the right information and regular practice, pretty much anyone can learn the guitar. My goal with this YouTube channel is to provide you with the right information. You have to provide the practice and I believe you can learn the guitar. Another question I had, uh, this one was from Diana May Potts. And uh, Diana said, when you come across a piece and you've never heard it before, when you see a stacked chord, do you pluck every note uh, all at the same time or do you do a quick arpeggio or is that up for interpretation? So it definitely is up for interpretation. I would say, you know, kind of the most standard thing is if you see a stack of four notes um, like this, you know, you would just play them all at the same time. But certainly one of the expressive things you can do in your interpretation is to roll those notes. And so I think that, um, I think that that is up to the interpretation, you know? And what I would say is just don't overdo it. Uh, you know, if you roll a chord here and there, it's a nice spice, so to speak. Uh, but if you just do it all the time, it's kind of like you dumped a bunch of spice on your food. It's just going to be overdone. So I was playing a little bit of this Giuliani theme earlier. Uh, it's uh, actually a handle theme that Giuliani wrote the variations on. Uh, but uh, let's say I just rolled every single chord. That's just overdone. That's not tasteful. But if I roll a chord every now and then, it's gonna be more tasteful. And just, you know, in that particular instance, I just rolled the one chord and it provided a nice little twist after hearing all the others played simultaneously. So hopefully that helps. Uh, Diana, I see Gene Madsen says, hello, Sean from rainy, soon to be snowy Southeast Idaho. Uh, good to see you, Gene, uh, here in central Virginia. We do have sunny weather right now. So uh, sounds like you're looking forward to uh, some snow and I hope you will enjoy that. We have not had snow here in Virginia yet, uh, but I expect in the next few weeks, uh, we'll probably see some snow as well. I see uh, Jai says, hi, sir, how are you? I'm well, thanks. I see Colin 
Hi, Sean, I'm a bit late, but hello. Hey, no worries, I was a couple minutes late myself. So Colin, it's great to see you here. And any of you guys, feel free to drop a question uh, in the chat or just uh, drop in there where you're watching from. I'd love to know where each of you are watching from today. Um, so another question also from Diana was talking about how do you know where to play a particular passage on the fretboard? And this is a great question. Uh, she actually sent a, uh, a little excerpt of music that was like this from this Brandel Inglese, which is... Um... And she was asking, you know, how do you decide where to play that on the neck? Uh, you know, I played it kind of with every note as low as possible, or at, at least as close to the nut as possible. And so that would be one approach. And a lot of times that's the approach beginners take is, hey, let me play as close to the nut as possible. And in a lot of cases, that's not a bad approach. You know, another approach would be to try to put as many notes on the same string as possible. And this is to get similar timbre. Uh, Francisco Targa did this a lot. Andre Segovia did this a lot. And the idea is if you're playing up and down a single string, uh, in the melody, then the timbre doesn't change so much. So I probably wouldn't do that in this particular piece, but let's just say if I did, um, that A, I'm gonna play on the third string, but then let's say I put the rest of the melody notes uh, mostly on the, um, the second string. Um, so other than the A, I could probably get them all on the second string. So is it possible to do that? Sure. Again, for music of Tarraga or some of the music written for Segovia, this is a very good approach. I'm not sure for this, which is more of a Renaissance piece, I'm not sure that this is what I would do. You know, it sort of lends itself to more of that romantic aesthetic, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century sort of aesthetic. So, um, you know, it just makes me feel like I should go like... <laughs> which is not quite the aesthetic I would normally recommend uh, for Renaissance music. Now, by the way, um, Diana kind of had another question related to this piece. She said, uh, do people play these uh, Renaissance pieces like the Branagh and the Galliard uh, a little bit too formally? Uh, because isn't this related to dance music? Yeah, absolutely. The, the Brandel and the uh, Galliard and some of these other forms, these were dances, uh, maybe more related to folk music. And so they were probably more lively than we sometimes play them on the classical guitar. We just make these, uh, you know, these past pieces into something formal for the concert setting. But uh, in a lot of cases, they probably weren't played that way. They were played more uh, rollicking. In fact, I remember uh, there was one account of uh, some of the music of the Renaissance where it was saying these dances were so wild and crazy and uh, then you'll hear again modern classical guitarists playing this type of a dance and just playing it very staid. So yeah probably we do play it a little too staid sometimes but you know at the same time we want to think about what is known about Renaissance performance practice and uh, and have that inform the way that we play these. So good questions uh, from Diana. Um, I will check the chat, just see if anybody has left a question in the chat. I see Jai says, sir, I have one problem. Day after tomorrow, I have a grade four classical guitar exam. Till this day, I practice well and did not make any mistakes, but from yesterday, I'm making a lot of mistakes. Give me suggestions. Oh man, I feel your pain. I totally feel it. You know, uh, a lot of times when a performance is coming up, uh, the mistakes will start to multiply, even if you've been practicing well before that. Sometimes, and I, I almost hesitate to say this, uh, but I think it's good advice, sometimes you need to just let off the gas pedal a little bit. You know, if you think about driving a car and just holding down the gas pedal the whole time, every now and then you just need to let off the gas a little bit. So what do I mean by that? Well. Uh, for example, you could actually practice a little less over the next couple of days. So if you're used to playing a couple hours a day, it doesn't you didn't say in your chat how much uh, time you're normally spending playing, but let's say that uh, you're normally spending um, you know, two hours a day practicing, well maybe only practice an hour and a half a day for the next couple of days uh, leading up to your performance. Uh, or another way to let off the gas would be just to practice a little slower. You know, practice at half tempo even, uh, which when you're preparing for a performance, you kind of feel like, I gotta play it at full tempo, full tempo. But actually, I have found it so helpful to play at half tempo. Um, so I remember 
Uh, a couple of anecdotes I will tell that maybe will help you. Uh, one is just thinking about the angst of a performance. I remember getting ready for my junior recital in college. And the night before my recital, I was just going nuts. Like nothing sounded good. Everything was full of mistakes and I had been practicing so hard and playing so well. And then just the day before the performance, it went out the window. And that was my anxiety, uh, my nervousness. It wasn't really that I wasn't prepared. It was just I was so nervous and I couldn't seem to play anything right. Uh, so don't do what I did. What I did is I got so frustrated, I punched a door and it was one of those hollow corridors and my fist actually went into the door and, uh, you know, it sobered me right up because I just realized in that moment I could have just broken my hand and I wouldn't have done a performance because I wouldn't have been able to play at all. And so that just calmed me right down and I realized, you know what, I probably need to set the guitar down for 30 minutes, chill out a little bit, and that's what I did. And then I came back to the guitar, I played slower, and I was a little bit more chill, and I played fine in my junior recital. So uh, don't, don't let the, the stress and the angst uh, and the anxiety get to you to the point that you do something stupid like punch a door. Um, you know, again, Maybe practice a little bit less, maybe practice a little bit slower, try to chill out. I can think of another more positive instance where one time I was competing in a competition and I'd really been thinking about the importance of slow practice. So I decided, you know what, in this uh, day leading up to the competition, I'm going to practice half tempo. And it felt so counterintuitive. And I decided even backstage and there's all these other competitors like ripping through stuff uh, really fast. And... Uh, you know, I was just like, I'm going to stick to my game plan. And so backstage, I'm playing half tempo. And they're probably like, this guy can't play the pieces at the target tempo. But I got out there on stage and I played really well. I advanced to the next round of the competition. I didn't ultimately win. Uh, but still, I felt like it was a victory of slow practice that I played my best and I advanced to the next round of the competition. So I think that um, really slowing down, taking the foot off the gas pedal is probably the best thing you can do over the next couple of days. So hope that helps. Uh, if you have other questions, do drop those in the chat. Another question I got in advance was from Gene Madsen. Uh, he said, I hope this isn't a dumb question. Now, I tell you what, with any question that's asked here, I always try to communicate that it's not a dumb question. I'm always glad to hear your questions. So Gene says, when you're playing a piece with multiple pages from a book, do you make copies of pages so there's no need to turn pages? Yeah, absolutely. When I'm playing uh, from a physical book, I typically do make photocopies of the pages. And I actually do it for multiple reasons. One, I really like to write fingerings all over the sheet music, but sometimes I get so much pencil scratching on the sheet music that I'd like to go back to a clean copy. So I like to have my original book be kind of my clean copy I can go back to. And so I'll make a photocopy, I'll write all over it, and if I write so much that I'm just like, I need a clean copy, I'll go back to the original and maybe make another copy. Uh, but so I like to do that. And that was actually another question from Gene. Do you write in fingerings on all the notes? Yes, I do. When I'm first learning a piece, I call that mapping the piece out. When I first start learning the piece, I write both the left hand fingerings, which a lot of people do, but I'll even write in right hand fingerings. If there's any doubt whatsoever what right hand fingering I'm doing, you know, P-I-M-A, I'll write that in the sheet music as well as writing in, you know, one, two, three, four for the left hand fingers. Uh, so absolutely, I'm a big fan of writing the fingers and that's one of the reasons I copy the pages. The other gene, as you mentioned, is for page turns. You know, if I've got a piece that's like five pages long, I'd rather be able to spread those out maybe on two music stands or, you know, sometimes I'll tape pages together or have pages taped to cardboard or something like that just so I don't have to deal with the logistics of page turns. A lot of times if I'm playing solo, I'm going to memorize the music and then I don't have to worry about that anymore. But even for practice, it's great not to have to worry about the page turns. Uh, but if it's chamber music, you know, guitar and flute or guitar and violin or something, then a lot of times I'm not memorizing the music. And so for the actual performance, I'll have the pieces uh, taped together or taped on cardboard so that I have all the page turns worked out where the page turn is not going to disrupt uh, the performance. So good questions, uh, Gene. I see Jai says, thank you, sir. I see Voyage says, thumbs up. Voyage, good to see you here on the stream today. Um, another question that I got in advance was from RNT. Advice for buying a new guitar for college. Well, I would say if you're um, you know, going to college or in college, buying a new guitar is a great thing to do. Um, you know, you don't want your guitar to be holding back your learning and your development. Um, I realize also that buying a new guitar can be a significant financial commitment and investment, but that's actually a good thing. If you're really thinking about making guitar playing and guitar teaching a career, then really putting some money 
into that kind of makes you have skin in the game. It's like, man, I better practice. I just put this money in a guitar. So if at all possible, I would encourage you to get a luthier built guitar. Now, um, a lot of times, you know, sometimes you can find a luthier who's early in their career and maybe you can find a luthier built guitar for like $3,000 US or something like that. But most of the time, a luthier built guitar is like four or five or $6,000. So again, I get it. That's not feasible for everybody. But what I did when I was going through my bachelor's is I actually bought this same Robert Ruck guitar that I still play today. And at that time I paid $6,000 for it. It's valued around $10,000 now. Uh, but the thing that I think about is I have put in you know, more than 10,000 hours of playing on this guitar. So, you know, it's like, you know, less than a penny per hour that I've played on this guitar. So if you think about it that way, it's well worth that investment. That investment I made during junior year of college is still paying off today. Now, by the way, how did I pay for a $6,000 guitar in college? Well, I was fortunate my parents were able to pay part of it, but I also paid part of it as well. And I worked a job and I saved money and it was a big deal. It was not easy for my parents. They were not well off to save up money to help pay for it. And then it was not easy for me to save and pay a portion of it myself as well. Uh, but both my parents and I were committed, hey, if I'm gonna do this guitar thing, if I'm going to go professional as a guitar player and teacher, then I've got to have a good luthier built instrument. And so I did that. So first off, I'd say if you can get a luthier built instrument, you know, scrimp and save, and it may take a couple years to do that, uh, then getting a luthier built instrument is worth it. Uh, what about the actual buying process? Uh, well, if you can try out as many guitars as possible, even ones that aren't for sale. So if your teacher has a really good guitar, if they'll let you play it a little bit just to feel what it feels like, that's great. If there are other students at the college where you study that have better guitars than you, if they will let you play them a little bit, that's helpful. Uh, some colleges will even have like a departmentally owned guitar. That's ideal. Not a lot of colleges have that. But if your college has a departmentally owned guitar you can borrow and try out, that's great. Uh, but if you can just go to whatever is a nearby um, store that has a lot of classical guitars, and sometimes you got to make a road trip because maybe the local music store doesn't have a lot of classical guitars. But if you can go to, you know, Guitar Salon International or uh, Maple Street Guitars in Atlanta, Georgia, or just, you know, somewhere that is a specialty shop for guitars, uh, for classical guitars specifically, and try a lot, uh, then you can really get a sense of what you love. And then uh, unfortunately, sometimes you find that the price tag is really high for the guitars you love. But again, maybe you save, maybe your family can help save with you uh, to invest in that really good guitar. And until you can have a luthier built guitar, if you don't, uh, then certainly you want the best uh, factory built guitar, you know, an Alhambra or Cordoba or whatever is the best guitar you can afford. But long term, if you're serious about music as a career, uh, you want to get a guitar built by an individual luthier. So I hope that helps. If you have other questions about buying a guitar, uh, let me know. I see Colin says, apologies for a repeat question. This relates to the right hand thumb. No matter how hard I try my right hand thumb falls behind my fingers. Any exercises to solve this? Thanks. Yeah, so absolutely. It can be an issue that thumb gets under the fingers. And, you know, historically speaking, some of the lute players back in the day would actually play with the thumb behind the fingers. And, uh, you know, for, for the loop technique, you know, especially if they're playing without nails, uh, that could work okay. For a modern classical guitar technique, it is pretty problematic for the right hand thumb to be behind the fingers because, you know, you're trying to play with index and middle and the thumb is in your way. So in general, you don't want to have the thumb behind the fingers. So Colin's kind of saying like, how do I fix this? Well, uh, what I would say is you just want to get the fingertip of the thumb out toward the fretboard as far as you can. And so um, I might suggest just exaggerating this at first. And so, you know, like if you do what I'm doing right now, you really exaggerate how far the thumb tip is out. Now I wouldn't play quite this exaggerated normally, but if you really get the thumb out away from the other fingers, then that's gonna really guarantee that it doesn't get behind the others. So I might just, as far as exercises, I might just do a simple exercise like PIMA and maybe even just stare down at your hand and hey, is my tip of my thumb way out, um, you know, to the left if you're a, you know, traditional right hand player, if you're the other way, then it'd be to the right, but whatever. But in other words, you want your thumb toward the neck. Um, and again, I would exaggerate at first and really try to get the thumb out there. Once you've exaggerated and played PIMA, PIMA a few times, then I might let it be less exaggerated 
but I still want it so that my thumb is coming to the outside of my index and the thumb's not coming inside. Another thing that will help is just curving the fingers. You know, if your index and middle fingers are too straight, then the thumb will more likely go up under. But if you keep the index and middle fingers more curved, then the thumb will more naturally come to the outside. So getting the thumb toward the fretboard and also just really curving the index and middle fingers uh, will help you to be able to keep the thumb outside of the fingers. So hopefully that helps. If you have other questions about that right hand shape, uh, do let me know. Another question that I got in advance was about combining cage shapes to make uh, scales. So in other words, uh, here on the YouTube channel, I've played uh, the Segovia scales, uh, the Segovia scale fingerings, which go up and down the neck. And so somebody was asking me like, how many shapes of scales are there? And I said, really, there's five, what we call this, the cage shapes, kind of associated with the C, A, G, E, and D chord shapes. Uh, so there's really sort of five shapes. So the C um, sort of position is, but then there's the A position. So if you were going to use a A chord to play this C, then that would be, you know, in this position, sorry, it's hard for me not to instinctively go out of the position, but that is the sort of A shape based uh, sort of pattern two. Pattern three sort of based on the G shape to play the C chord. And then pattern four based on the E shape to play the C scale or the C chord. And then pattern five based on the D shape. You know, so any of the like Segovia scales or other scales that go up and down the neck, they're combining those. So again, I would call it sort of patterns one to five, or you could call it C-A-G-E-D, the caged acronym. But uh, so that like Segovia C major, for example, uh, I'm starting in what I would call pattern two or the A-shape pattern. And then halfway through the Segovia pattern, I'm moving to pattern three or what I would call that G-shape pattern. And so any of those um, scales that uh, combine multiple patterns like Royal Conservatory um, technique books, you know, the scales in there, or um, again, Segovia scales or any other scales that traverse up and down the fretboard, they're combining these others. So like if you do, you know, a G major, um, this is kind of the E shape or pattern four, um, you know, you know, but uh, then it goes from the E shape to the D shape. Uh, here and um, you know so if you keep going with the Segovia you know right here it goes uh, to the C shape and then to the A shape and then to the C shape and kind of stays there and then back to the E shape uh, hopefully I said that right but um, but anyway it, the point is it's transitioning among those different shapes one through five or c-a-g-e-d so um, if you learn the individual sort of caged patterns those five patterns then you kind of have freedom like you know if you're playing a c major scale what if i transition in and out and don't do the segovia fingering then it just kind of gives you freedom to traverse the whole fingerboard in a particular key. So if you have other questions about that, let me know in the chat. Uh, I see Jai says, sir, are there any exercises to control right hand buzzing sound? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, when you say right hand, I think of the plucking hand. And again, it depends, you know, maybe you play the other way where you're plucking with your left hand. But um, if you're talking about your right hand, you know, I think of most buzzes coming from the fretting hand, not the plucking hand. Uh, so I'll kind of talk about both. But if you've got a buzz coming from the from the plucking hand, uh, which is, would be my right hand, then it's often because you're accidentally uh, sort of placing the nail or the fingertip on the string in, in not the best way. So I've trained really hard not to do this, so it's almost hard for me to do this on purpose, but there we go. You know, but if you kind of place the finger on the string 
where you get like just nail only or something like that, you can get this kind of buzz in the plucking hand. And so to avoid that, you really want to get a good combination with nail and flesh and just a firm, secure plant on the string. So I would, as far as exercises, you know, it could be whatever. It could be PIMA, AMIP, pretty much any exercise, like arpeggio exercise or something like that. But just making sure that each finger is planting securely with a combination of nail and flesh on the string and that you're not, you know, getting that weird um, kind of like just the nail on the string in a way that creates a buzz. Now, so that's buzzing with the plucking hand, which I think was your question. Of course, you can also create buzzes all the time with your fretting hand, and that's almost the harder one to deal with. Um, you know, there can be buzzes because you're not right by the fret wire. Uh, that can cause buzzes, so you want to be right by the fret wire whenever possible. Uh, there can be buzzes because you're touching an adjacent string. Uh, so let's say you're playing the the you know C chord and you mute that third string a little bit with your middle finger you can create this nasty buzz so you gotta curve your finger more and keep it away from the adjacent string uh, that would be a good way to avoid buzzes there so staying close to the fret wire not touching the adjacent string accidentally those are a couple things to avoid buzzes in the fretting hand uh, so kind of a little bit uh, for both hands. Now, I got this question from Zivi, Zivi Rothenberg. Hopefully I'm saying that right. And he said, in book two of Parkin and Guitar Method, page 16, exercises 7A and 7B, can you show how to play that? Well, Zivi, this is a good question. And, you know, every now and then I get a question. I'm like, oh, boy, this is a fun one. Uh, this exercise is really hard. And so I feel like parkening is kind of like, all right, you know, if you're working out in the gym, let's throw a couple of other plates on your barbell, so to speak, you know, like let's make it extra hard. So he has this slur exercise that's left hand only. So I'm just going to say this is a hard exercise, but let me go ahead and demonstrate. So 7A um, is like this. And basically what parkening says is you should do this left hand only, no right hand. And that's what makes it so hard to get it to come out clearly. But I'm going to give it a shot. Okay, so that was 7A from page 16 of the Parkening Book, uh, Volume 2, Parkening Guitar Method, Volume 2. And uh, that is a tricky one. So again, you're trying to do these hammer-ons and pull-offs with the left hand only, no right hand. It's a great exercise for the left hand. And then 7B is a descending exercise. Now, this one's even harder because if you're trying to keep the right hand out of it, then like the ascending slides are a little easier to get to come out. The descending slides are a bear. So you're going to hear when I do these descending slides, they don't come out as well as I'd like. Um, so, you know, full disclosure, I don't love the way these sound, but let's give it a shot. So that's how that exercise works. Again, those descending slides are a bear to get to come out. Now, one thing I'll say is these hammer-ons on pull-offs do come out better and the slides as well when you play faster. But I would advocate, like with anything, it's good to practice them slowly so you really work on control. But as far as getting them to come out a little bit better, you know, the notes come out left hand alone a little better when you play faster, but start slow for control and then uh, work it up a little faster. So those are tricky exercises. Great question. Uh, that is a fun one. Uh, so as you have other questions, feel free to drop those in the chat. Another question I got in advance was from Robert Stephen Dollard. He says, always looking for the great American guitar concerto from the USA. Lots of nice ones from uh, European transfers, South American, Cuban, Mexico, but the United States. I've heard the Foss and the Previn, yet nothing that in my estimation is a true classic of the genre. Any that fit that bill for you? Well, I guess one of the things I'll say is it's hard to say what really makes something American music. Because as you say, there are people that have moved from Europe to America. I mean, Previn, for example, moved from 
uh, Europe to America. Uh, so, you know, is Previn really an American composer? Um, another example would be like Castelnuovo Tedesco, who was Italian, but he did move to America later in life. So would Castelnuovo Tedesco be an American composer? Obviously, he wrote a couple of guitar concertis. So um, this is a tough one because it's just because America has had so much immigration. It's hard to say who's really an American composer. Is it anybody who's lived in America? Uh, Dusan Bogdanovich is not an American composer, but he's lived in America for a portion of his life. So does that make him an American composer? He's written a guitar concerto. So, you know, I just think it's a bit tough to define what does it even mean to be an American composer. But there's definitely plenty of people out there. There's, you know, Robert Beezer, John Corleano, uh, Lucas Foss that you mentioned, Elmer Bernstein. I will say I enjoy the Elmer Bernstein uh, concerto, which was written for Christopher Parkening. Some people might say, hey, it's a little too listener friendly. It's a little too accessible. Um, you know, a lot of times people in the classical music world sort of say, hey, you know, modern music should be really esoteric. It should be really complicated. And man, some of those modern American guitar concerti are definitely complicated and esoteric. But I enjoy the Elmer Bernstein because it is more straightforward and more listener friendly. Uh, so is, a, you know, short answer to Robert's question, is there one U.S. guitar concerto that's like, hey, this is the U.S. answer to the Iran Huez? I'm not sure there is. I mean, the Iran Huez is like the go-to concerto of all time, so to speak, for the guitar. And uh, is there a, an, a United States answer to the Iran Huez of like, hey, this is the iconic um, American guitar concerto? I don't know. There's certainly some very interesting uh, concerti, some of those that I've already mentioned by American composers, but I don't know if there's one that's like, hey, this is, this is the new Iran Huez from the United States. I just don't know if that's out there. But interesting question, very interesting. All right. I see here um, SCPRP player says, could you talk a little bit about grace notes like in scales and chords because I play a certain piece that changes the order uh, of what you play in comparison with the tab because you can't hammer on a full chord. Yeah, so it's uh, an interesting question and I feel like grace notes are one of those kind of weird situations where a lot of times the way they're typically performed on the guitar is different than the way you might uh, think they would be performed. Uh, let me see if I can get a piece of sheet music up here as a possible example. So let me just pull something up uh, that we can take a quick look at um, as an example of grace notes. So bear with me for one sec. thought I was going to get something pulled up and I uh, not finding it as quick as I had hoped. Well, I'll just go ahead and talk about it. So um, basically uh, what will happen a lot of times is you'll see something where let's say there's, um, you know, this chord, let's say, let's just make something up. Um, you have this chord and you have this F sharp that's written as a grace note. So what you would instinctively think is the little grace note F sharp is before it. So, you know, you think it's supposed to be like you know, where the grace notes played first and then the whole chord is played after that. Um, but, you know, the thing is, a lot of times on the guitar, those are performed where the F sharp is played with the chord and then you hammer on, so. And a lot of this gets complicated because it kind of depends on the sort of era the piece was written. Um, and sometimes you've got to do a little research and listen to some knowledgeable, um, you know, professional performers. Uh, what's really appropriate here, you know, in a Baroque piece versus a classical period piece versus a romantic piece uh, versus a modern piece. But in the guitar specifically, a lot of times when the grace note's written, instead of expecting to play the grace note before and then the chord, a lot of times it's performed where you play that grace note with the rest of the chord and then hammer on or pull off to the other note. Um, so that's just really confusing, but it's the most common way to play grace notes on the guitar. And every now and then you'll, you'll need the other. And really a lot of times it's just research uh, finding out about the style period and the particular composer and also listening to some very knowledgeable performers to help make the decision. Um, and sometimes even still, even after doing the research, you don't have a definitive answer and then you just have to go with the best knowledge you have based on the research and based on the listening you've done. So that's a good question. Um, like I said, not an easy question, but a lot of times that grace note ends up being played on the beat with the chord and then you play um, the other note just very quickly, you know, after that. So good question. 
Uh, good question. Another question, do you like to use vibrato in your pieces? Absolutely. Do you bend the strings like a rocker or do you prefer the parallel to the string kind of vibrato? Yeah, good question. So typically a rock vibrato, you know, a rock guitar player, they typically do, you know, kind of bend the string like this. This is the more, you know, rock guitar vibrato. Um, whereas a classical vibrato is more along the string. Uh, now, I'll give a shout out uh, to Zeno, who also has a YouTube channel, but kind of is more active on TikTok these days. Uh, but Zeno is a classical guitarist, Zeno Mueller. And uh, he was talking the other day on one of his uh, sort of short videos uh, on TikTok about how uh, you can change the feel of the vibrato by adding fingers behind the main finger. And I think this is something that isn't talked about enough. So props to Zeno for mentioning this. But in other words, uh, we do as classical guitarists typically vibrate along the string. And actually, before I get to Zeno's comment, uh, let me just talk a little bit more about distinguishing the rock vibrato from the classical vibrato. So the rock vibrato is raising the pitch above the note and coming back to it. So the rock vibrato never goes below the pitch. And I've had students question this. Well, can't you bend in the other direction? Yes, but either way you bend the string, you're raising the pitch because you're tightening uh, the string, you're raising the tension and that's gonna raise the pitch. But with the classical vibrato, you're both going below and above the pitch. That's because when you go parallel to the string, when you push to the bridge, you're lowering the tension on the string, you're lowering the pitch. When you, when you pull back this way, you're raising the pitch. So the classical vibrato goes above and below the pitch, whereas the rock vibrato just goes above the pitch. So that's a distinction. As far as how to practice vibrato, I'll talk about that and I'll get to Zeno's point in a second. But practicing vibrato, I like to practice it in the ninth position. So up by the body of the guitar, if you have a standard guitar body, not a cutaway, not an elevated fingerboard, it works really nicely just to kind of let your hand hit the side of the guitar. And you can use this to kind of develop a rhythmic sense in vibrato. Because when you're playing the classical vibrato, you want a nice sort of rhythmic uh, steadiness to your vibrato. And it's kind of feels abstract in the middle of the neck. But if you're up here by the body of the guitar, it's really kind of clear, am I doing this rhythmically? You can even set a metronome and, you know, kind of like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four and just you know get that steadiness of vibrato. Now, I'm gonna to come to Zeno's point though. What Zeno was saying is as you add fingers behind the vibrato, it can change the quality of the vibrato. And I think Zeno's making an excellent point. So here's the regular vibrato one finger. Here's adding a second finger. Here's adding a third finger. You can just you know add more width to the vibrato you know, with some extra fingers for leverage. So in a slow melody, that can be nice. Uh, you don't want to overdo it though, because you can definitely, you know, get kind of a little too wild with the vibrato um, if you overdo it. But, you know, just whatever is tasteful for the stylistic period for the particular piece uh, that you're working on. So a good question there. As you have other questions, uh, do drop those in the chat. Another question I got in advance was, I've never tried learning the tremolo effect as it seems too difficult for me. Now I avoid pieces that have the tremolo technique. How do I get it to sound smooth so that one finger doesn't sound more emphasized than another? Would shorter nails help? Uh, good question. So tremolo is a beast. Tremolo is just hard. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It is. Um, every now and then I run across somebody that just seems to have a natural tremolo. Uh, I had a student years ago who was like in high school and he just had this awesome tremolo just kind of right out of the gate the first time he tried it. And um, I tried not to hate him, you know, but like tremolo is just hard. Uh, for most of us, uh, barring that rare exception, it's just a hard technique. So how do you do it? Well, having shorter nails can help just, you know, less likely to catch on the string. But in general, it's like so many things. It's a lot of slow practice. Um, and I even, I like what Scott Tennant says about practicing on a single string. So I like, you know, just starting P-A-M-I. That's the typical tremolo right hand for the classical guitar is P-A-M-I. So just P-A-M-I on the same string uh, is a really good technique. And uh, it allows you to really listen, is one of the fingers sticking out, even the thumb. Ideally, you don't want the thumb to stick out and you definitely don't want the AMRI to stick out. So just on that single first string, can you get all the fingers to be rhythmically even and even in volume? And once you can kind of get that evenness and maybe, you know, increase the speed a little bit, you know, then, um, you know, letting the thumb now change strings, 
you know, and kind of make that an exercise. And then from there, add the left hand. And I always like just using the beginning of Ruperto's de la Ombra by Targa, which is probably one of the most famous tremolo pieces, if not the most famous tremolo piece. And so if you just use the first couple of chords of that, it's a great tremolo exercise. Yeah, tremolo technique just takes a lot of practice and you really have to work slowly, gradually build up the tempo and really work on the evenness, uh, both even rhythmically and also even in volume so you get all of the fingers to work equally. A follow-up about tremolo is could you do uh, the thumb and just two fingers emitting the A, so like P-I-M-I -I or P-M-I-M. Yeah, and this is what Anna Vidovich does. And uh, she's one of the few players I know that does this just really, really well. But she does this P-M-I-M tremolo. So if she were doing recuerdos. And I haven't practiced this much, but. So you can see, I haven't practiced it much. It's harder for me than the P-A-M-I. P-A-M-I. You know, there's the PAMI, which I'm more used to, but trying to do, you know, Anna's way. I have to go slower because I'm not used to it. But Anna can just rip the speed with the PAMIM. So clearly, Anna proves that you can do tremolo that way and do it very, very well. Uh, but, you know, others like David Russell have a beautiful tremolo with the traditional PAMI. So, yeah, you can do it both ways. And certainly, you know, if you're beating your head against a wall with PAMI, it's not a bad idea to try it with PMIM. I've played around with it, but I just find the PAMI works better for me. But it's a tricky technique, however you uh, do it. I see Cosmonaut says, what exactly does a trill symbol above a note tell me to do? Is it just a quick ascending slur to a half note above and a descending one back? Or do I do that multiple times? So this is a great question. So there's actually sort of different symbols that you might see. And before, I was having a little trouble pulling up some sample sheet music. Uh, but let me maybe try again. But it is going to depend a little bit on context and style and some things like that. So uh, let me go ahead and share... Um, a particular piece of sheet music for a second and maybe I'll go to another piece here as well but good question so in this particular piece um, this is um, this is Adelita by Francisco Targa and so in this particular piece you see these little trill symbols right here so in this piece this is a kind of up and back, so to speak. So you start on C sharp, you trill up, or start on D sharp, trill up to E, and back to the D sharp. Then you go to C sharp, trill up to the D sharp and back. So. So if I were to play it more in tempo. So you're starting on the main note, you're hammering on to a higher note, and you're pulling back down. So that is one way that you can do a trill. But again, it changes a bit stylistically. So that, I think, is the right way to do that in this particular targa piece, is to start on the main note, hammer on, and then pull off back to the main note. But in a Bach piece, for example, that might be different. So let me see if I can pull up a Bach piece real quick. Um, this website, by the way, is classicalguitarschool.com. If you're not familiar with it, it's a cool website that has a lot of free sheet music out there. A lot of uh, public domain uh, sheet music that you can find. Uh, so for Bach, let's go to the first lute suite. And I'm going to just uh, click into the beret real quick, the famous E minor beret. Oops. All right, so this one doesn't even have a trill symbol, but most people play a trill in uh, the sort of second to last measure of the first section. Uh, so. So this particular edition doesn't even have a trill symbol. Some editions do. But the way I would play the trill here is I would start at the upper note. So I would start at G above the F sharp, pull off to the F sharp, play the G again, and pull off to the F sharp, and then continue on. So, so starting a note above what's notated, 
and then trilling, as opposed to the targa where I started on the main note and trilled up. And so, um, you know, a broad brush distinction would be a lot of times in Baroque music, you start the trill on the note above the notated note. A lot of times in the 19th century music like targa, you start on the main note and trill up. But that is a broad generalization. And I think you got to kind of take it case by case, each piece and each composer, what's intended. Certainly there are cases in Baroque music where you would start from the main note. There'd be cases in 19th century music where you'd start from the upper note. So it really takes some kind of reading up on the style and the composer and the piece, and also listening to some great performers to see how it's done. But, you know, a trill started out, you know, like in the Baroque period, for example, as an improvisatory thing. So, you know, there's lots of ways you could do it. In this piece, uh, the beret, because it's fast tempo, you're probably gonna do it pretty quick, you know. But like, imagine if this were a slower piece, uh, you could potentially play around with the rhythm and the number of repetitions of the trill. And a lot of times that's what performers will do in a slower piece is they'll, you know, maybe start slow in a cello rondo with the trill. So there's some freedom in the trill, but yeah, you want to find out for the particular piece and the context, you know, does this start on the main note or the upper note? How many times should I trill? Those sorts of things. And there's definitely some good resources out there um, on that. You know, there's some good additions like the Frank Kuntz edition of the Bach Lute Suites talks a lot about uh, what types of trills or mordants or other ornaments are appropriate in specific places. And uh, so it's good to have a really good edition that has some notes on this sort of thing. So another question that I saw in the chat, Colin says, how do you build up playing endurance? I watched David Russell play a piece which lasted seven minutes, which was amazing. And I see Maynack says, hello, Sean. Hello, Maynack, good to have you here on the stream. Uh, so yeah, Colin, to your question, I think building endurance is just something that takes time and practice. And so, you know, it's especially hard if it's a fast piece that lasts for a long time. You know, it's one thing if it's like a slow piece with no bar chords, but if it's a fast piece or if it has a lot of bar chords, that does take an element of endurance. So I think, you know, you just have to build up to it gradually. Uh, partly depends on how much time you're used to spending a day. You know, let's say if you're used to spending 30 minutes a day in practice, uh, then playing like an hour long recital is not gonna be feasible. You're just not used to playing that long. Um, so, you know, just getting used to playing an hour or two hours a day will help with your endurance. Uh, but specifically as far as playing like a seven minute long piece, um, you know, I would work up to it. So maybe, you know, if, if you were wanting to learn a seven minute long piece, you might just try playing, you know, eight measures of it or 16 measures of it and just try to get really good at that and then get good at the next eight measures or 16 measures and then put that together. Now you've got 32 measures and uh, kind of build up from there. Um, you know, maybe a page of music at a time if, if the piece spans five or six pages. Um, but you just got to kind of build up that endurance gradually until you get to the point where you can play a five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten minute long piece uh, eventually. So good question uh, there from Colin. All right. Um, another question I got in advance was, what does the phrase left hand finger independence refer to? Do you ever practice uh, your finger independence exercise with an exercise uh, like the ones in the Pumping Nylon and Scott Tennant book? Yeah, absolutely. I love uh, several of the exercises that Scott Tennant has. He has these exercises where you put all your fingers on the third string and then you move just the first finger back and forth. Uh, first, you move it from the fifth to the second string. Then you move it to the sixth to the first string. Then you do the same sort of thing with your middle finger from the fifth to the second string and the sixth to the first string. That's a great exercise for left hand independence. You do the same thing with your third finger and then you do the same thing with your pinky finger. So that is a great exercise. And then he even has you alternate fingers. So again, put everything, put all your fingers on the third string and then you alternate second and first finger, first on the fifth and second strings and then on the sixth and first. And this is a great left hand independent exercise from Scott Tennant's Pumping Nylon Guitar Technique Handbook. Then you can do the same thing with like the third and second fingers. And again, you know, it's a little bit of a stretch when you get to the sixth and first strings, but it's great for developing the independence uh, of the left hand. And then the hardest one is the third and fourth fingers, you know, getting those out to the sixth and first string and doing the alternation. Uh, that is tricky, but it's a great way to develop the finger independence uh, for the left hand. I see Menek says, this is a question about performance. Are you always singing the melody in your head during a live performance? Well, I wouldn't say always, but I think it is a really good practice 
you know, if you're kind of just focused on the melody in your mind as if you're singing it, um, I think that will help you to stay focused and stay in the moment with what you're doing. So I think it's a good practice. Uh, you know, there are some examples where people will actually sing under their breath while they play an instrument. Glenn Gould was a famous pianist and you can hear on some of his recordings even him kind of humming the melody um, and sometimes not humming the melody, you know, in the best key, but um, just humming it slightly off key even in some of his recordings, but it really helped him to stay focused and he was a fabulous pianist. Uh, there are definitely some classical guitarists that I've heard, you know, they'll hum under their breath while they're performing. And it definitely is a way to help yourself stay focused. So do I always do it? No. But do I think it's a good thing to do? Yes. I think it's good to hum. I think it's probably better practice as an instrumentalist not to be actually humming where the audience can hear you or singing where the audience can hear you unless, you know, you're actually a good singer and you're intentionally singing along but uh, for the most part I would I would just be singing along in my head uh, to the melody but I do think it's a great thing and in practice I think singing the melody uh, singing the melody without playing and then singing the melody while you play is a great practice technique and then in performance yeah singing along with the melody in your head I think is a good thing um, another question I got in advance was about as you shift from position to position along the fretboard, how do you avoid a scraping sound on the bass strings? And this is a great question. You know, a lot of times when you have these big shifts on the basses, you know, it's easy to get a lot of noise. So a few things, um, you know, one is simply to be aware of it and just uh, try to minimize it. Uh, one of the ways you can do this is to slide a little more on the pad of the finger. You know, normally in the left hand, I'd rather be up on the fingertip, but if your fingertip gets a callus, the callus will make more of that scraping noise. And so just kind of being on the flat of the fingertip can help reduce that, that a little bit, but you, you know, it'll kind of still be there. Another thing that's a little more um, extreme, I guess, but Christopher Parkening used to soak his fingers in warm water when he was recording. So you wouldn't hear that scrape on the recording. And that definitely works if you put your left hand fingertip in warm water and then play the calluses are softened up and it, you won't hear that scrape as much sometimes you can even kind of pull the fingertip behind the finger and just kind of doing that you know pulling the fingertip behind the finger a little bit can minimize the scrape uh, also you can get uh, sort of flat wound or polished bass strings uh, where the strings themselves are less likely um, to buzz because of this. I, I know one of my students was trying some of the D'Addario polished basses and it really made a dramatic difference in his squeaking. He was squeaking so much less on the basses with the D'Addario polished basses. So getting some specific um, bass strings that um, you know, help you to avoid those scrapes can be really a good thing. Um, I see another uh, question in the chat. This is from Trenton. Hi, Sean, I can play Capriccio Arabe fairly well with little mistakes, what could be a next piece I could practice on your experience? I'm looking to practice my IMA rest strokes. Huh, that's an interesting question, specifically on practicing the IMA rest strokes. Um, you know, as far as a piece that's similar to uh, Capriccio Arabe in difficulty, I was going to say maybe one of the Villalobos preludes or, um, you know, maybe uh, like Asturias by Albanis or something like that. But since you're specifically looking to practice rest stroke, um, with IMA, I would say maybe Sevilla by Albanis. You could play uh, I, am, I am rest strokes on some of the melodies in Sevilla by Albanis. Uh, that would be another one you could do. Um, uh, perhaps the Taroba Sonatina, um, Sonatina by Federico Moreno Taroba. That might be another piece that would be maybe similar difficulty level to Capriccio Arabe. Uh, but yeah, Capriccio Arabe is a beautiful piece. I love that piece. Uh, but yeah, so maybe the Taroba Sonatina, maybe a Sevilla by Albanis uh, might be other pieces of a similar level where you could do some, some rest stroke on some of those melodies. Uh, so good question. Awesome. Uh, well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the stream for today. I plan to be live again next Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern U.S. time. So I hope you'll join me again next Monday and bring all your guitar questions. I love answering questions. Whether you send them in advance, you can always just post uh, a question in the comments on any video on my channel. Uh, but also, um, you can put your questions in the chat during the live stream and always love answering them live in the chat. So have a great week. Keep making music. And I'll see you in the next one.